So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Standard, and today we're going to be talking about uh, learning .NET systems programming the hard way, and a little bit about uh, sort of my discoveries and experiences along the way. Welcome everyone who's coming in. There should be plenty of seats around here still. Uh, so a little bit about me. I've been a .NET developer since 2005. I started learning .NET. I think it was .NET 2.0 had just come out. Uh, I was a college intern working for a, a company called the Fair Isaac Corporation. Uh, they use machine learning to compute everybody's credit worthiness in the United States. Um, I also have built a large scale software as a service application on top of .NET. Um, it was basically a, a multi-tenant real-time analytics and marketing automation system for developers who are building apps for the uh, Windows Store. And as part of working on uh, that company, I co-created Akka.net and have been the maintainer of it since about 2013. So this November, Akka.net will turn 10. And I've been working on it uh, continuously, more or less. And what I'm responsible for in the, well, in terms of what Akka.net does, if you're not familiar with it, it's an implementation of the Erlang-style actor model, but on .NET. So it's sort of a canonical implementation of the actor model. Um, this is designed for handling highly concurrent and distributed workloads. So we deal with all sorts of system issues, such as working with, th with threads, working with network I.O., serialization, uh, context switching, and these are all concepts we're going to be touching on in the presentation today. Uh, the primary thing that Akka.net is used for is building mission-critical real-time applications. So I'd like to give you a real-world example of that. We have a lot of customers and spaces like uh, real-time uh, fleet and logistics tracking for cargo networks, trains, ships, that type of thing. We have a lot of customers that use Akka.net for running real-time financial systems, so being able to do things like automatically trade currency or be able to manage positions in a big equities portfolio. And we even get used for some more fun stuff like multiplayer video games. So given the space that we're in, performance is an essential feature of our work on the Akka.net project. And this is sort of what I've learned while working on that feature. The first place we'll kind of start talking about systems programming is garbage collection in .NET. Uh, the garbage collector is going to be one of the biggest sources of potential CPU consumption inside your system, potentially, if you're not very efficient about how you allocate objects. But on top of that, the garbage collector in .NET is highly configurable. You can go ahead and reduce the penalty that garbage collection imposes on your application by adjusting a couple of settings. And I'm going to show you one very powerful setting in just a moment. Or by maybe changing the way you manage the lifespan of some of your objects. So the way .NET garbage collection typically works is let's say, for instance, we have this set of memory on our left initially, right? Where we go ahead and have a total, let's say, seven objects in memory. And then the application forms roots to those objects. These are active references for other objects that are not yet marked for deletion. So as long as an object is rooted, it will be retained in memory by the garbage collector. An object that is not rooted will be collected and its memory will be freed and released back to the application. That's what the garbage collection process does. It tries to identify those unrooted objects and free up that memory. So after the garbage collector runs, there's one more important thing that you'll kind of see on the diagram here, which is that those objects that are arrayed in memory all get compressed together again in memory as well. This sort of compaction of free memory is designed to help accelerate the allocation of new objects in the future. So the garbage collector, in addition to freeing uh, objects that are no longer rooted, is also responsible for trying to compact memory together. That compaction process is actually really essential for helping make your applications fast. Imagine if you had, let's say, a collection of different objects that you were working with inside some key business context. Well, if they're all available sequentially together in memory, that makes it more likely that you can take advantage of caching at the hardware layer inside your computer. It also makes this access much quicker because it's all sort of sequential increments of a pointer that way. Whereas if that memory was highly fragmented, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of that, and you'd see a noticeable performance hit doing it. So the garbage collector does all this for you, more or less. We have four generations of garbage collection in .NET, essentially. Um, first is what we call Gen Zero garbage collection. The, gener the, more, the higher up the, the generation is, the more expensive it is to run. So Gen Zero garbage collection is the cheapest, and these are for objects that are essentially ephemeral. So for instance, 
If you allocate a string inside the scope of a function, do some work with it, uh, maybe you write it out to the console, and then that function exits, that's going to be Gen 0 collected, more than likely. And we're going to see a little example of that in a second. So th that's the, sort of the cheapest form of garbage collection. And the reason why it's cheap is that we go and allocate that object at the top of the heap, and then immediately take it off the heap again without necessarily needing to do a complex um, routing sort of calculation inside the GC system. So it's really easy to get stuff off the top of the heap and uh, back again. Doesn't also doesn't require any compaction when we do that. Gen, zero, Gen 1 garbage collection is slightly more expensive. These are for objects that survive at least one uh, Gen 0 garbage collection attempt. So they get promoted into a higher generation. Uh, so these might be objects that maybe get assigned as a property to a class, and that class gets passed around across multiple methods, and over you know, a, a handful of garbage collection runs, uh, that object is still in use, still rooted, so we don't, we don't collect it right away. But generally, it's going to get collected after a fairly short period of time in Gen 1. So Gen 1 is only incrementally more expensive than Gen 0. Gen 2 is where things get really interesting. Uh, these are the long-lived objects inside your application that have survived multiple Gen 1 garbage collection attempts. These tend to be things like, for instance, if you have a, a static property inside your application, that's always going to live in Gen 2 garbage collection, and in fact, will probably never be uh, collected. Uh, or another example of this might be if you have some objects that are extremely long-lived. So a good example with you know, Akka.net and the actor space, if you have an actor that's running in the background and they can run for months or days at a time, that actor and all of its state will all be in the Gen 2 garbage collection category. And then finally, we have sort of our fourth generation here, which is kind of a, a special case. This is the large object heap. Um, I'm blinking on, actually, no, I'm not blinking. I have a note that tells me here. Um, in order to be on the large object heap, it has to be a object that is bigger than 85K is how big it needs to be. So if you have a really large buffer, Maybe you've done something like load a uh, binary file from disk, or maybe you have a super big object graph. That goes in the large object heap, and that gets treated a little bit differently because the cost of memory compaction is a lot higher for doing that. You're compacting a lot more stuff all at once when that occurs. All right. There we go. Okay, let me turn my mouse on. All right. So the .NET memory model. Let's take a look at this little piece of code right here. So I have a, this is inside a class, and I have a private read-only field that accesses this random.shared property. Uh, random.shared is a static type that's built into, I think this is .NET 6. So that is going to be a Gen 2 garbage collected object. Inside this method, we are going to use that random to generate two integers. Integers are value types. So they belong on the stack. They're not even going to get garbage collected. They're just simply going to be released as this function exits the stack once it completes. But down below, if I go ahead and let's say add up that integer, so I you know, sum those two integers together, and I convert that result to a string and write that out to the console, here's what's going to happen. I have my stack, which basically consists of everything that's happening inside this function while it's executing. And some of these are going to be local instructions that are all local to the stack. Again, that's not going to touch the heap, which is what uh, .NET uses for allocating you know, uh, reference types like classes. On the heap, I'm going to go ahead and have a reference to the method itself. I'm going to have a reference to that static uh, field. And then further down on the heap, I'm going to have the string that I allocated while I executed this method once. What's going to end up happening is that this string is going to get garbage collected via Gen 0. That uh, random.shared will be in Gen 2. All of those integers are on the stack. They're value types, so we don't garbage collect them at all. They're just automatically freed. And this method belongs to a class that could either be Gen 0, Gen 1, or Gen 2, depending on how long it lives. So for generally speaking, for garbage collection purposes, from a performance standpoint, uh, we know that basically garbage collection costs increases with the size of the generation. A Gen 2 garbage collection is going to involve a lot more compaction and a lot more memory, basically reducing a lot more memory fragmentation from a lot more places. And the garbage collector will introduce what's called a garbage collection pause, potentially, inside possibly your foreground thread, or depending on how you configure it, background threads. We're going to talk about that configuration in just a second. So the ability to not have as many of those expensive Gen 2 garbage collection pro attempts
will actually help improve the overall throughput and efficiency of our application. So if we can, we want to try to keep our allocations limited to either the stack, so value types, or we want to try to stay inside Gen 0, Gen 1. That's going to ultimately result in the cheapest garbage collection overall and is going to help keep our memory less fragmented. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, in Gen 0, if we're allocating something at the top of the heap, and we'll talk about how the heap's organized in a minute, if we're allocating stuff at the top of the heap, because that's just you know the code that's executing right here in this moment, everything lower on the heap is all the older Gen 2, Gen 1 stuff that survived multiple garbage collection attempts. We can allocate that string on the heap and then pop it right off when that function exits, and that's very, very inexpensive to do. It doesn't involve moving other objects around in memory. So that's one of the reasons why it's so cheap. Now, if you have Gen 2 objects, the right approach for maybe trying to help manage performance there is keep Gen 2 objects available in memory forever. No garbage collection for those objects will occur if they're still rooted. This is where, and we're going to get into some examples of this, concepts like memory pooling and object pooling kind of enter the picture, where maybe rather than having a bunch of new string builders allocated continuously behind the scenes, maybe it's better to have a shared pool of a thousand of them that get rented periodically uh, throughout the course of your application running. That might actually result in a lot less memory fragmentation and a lot less garbage collection over the course of your application's lifetime. So yeah, this is where we get into things like object pools. Um, so I think Daniel in his talk yesterday mentioned um, the array pool for being able to go ahead and get uh, essentially chunks of memory you could use for working through uh, buffers and that sort of thing. Microsoft also supports arbitrary pools of objects as well, where rather than it just being bytes, it actually might be a functional object you can go ahead and reuse over and over again. And the best candidates for these things are reusable types, such as string builder is, ex is the example we're going to take a look at, I think. Uh, byte arrays also work as well, but there's more specialized, uh, basically, pools for that, like the memory pool type. Uh, and you might also be able to um, have a couple of other reusable types for doing things like serialization, potentially. But string builder is probably a really good candidate because it's an object that uh, can be inherently sort of expensive to spin up and create, but you can also clear all of its state when you return it to the pool. That's what makes it reusable. So to give you an example, this is some code from the Akka.net project here where we are doing a JSON serialization inside um, Akka.net. This is like our default serializer. Now, one of the things that we decided to do is Rather than basically allocating a brand new string builder each and every time, we were going to allocate up front when the process first began a fixed number of them. I think 1024 string builders is what we decided by default. So we're going to go ahead and get a reference to a string build, uh, builder pool and just grab one copy of a string builder that we're going to use right here inside this newtonsoft.json operation. So we go ahead and pass in that string builder into the JSON text writer down below. We call serialize, and then we convert this to a, a byte array. And then at the very end, in our little finally block, we return that string builder we just used back to the pool all over again. Well, to give you a sense of what the performance impact of this looked like, uh, I have here on screen you know, some benchmark.net results from when we had uh, pooling, no pooling, and then multi-threaded versions of both of these benchmarks. This is a theme you're going to see show up over and over again, is that our benchmark numbers start to change when we start making them concurrent. Um, that's something that we're going to focus on as well. So here, I can see that our pooled implementation used about 49.7 megabytes, whereas our unpooled implementation used about 71 megabytes. That's a 30% you know, memory savings. On top of that, we completely eliminated Gen 1 garbage collection uh, period by using the pooling system instead. So that helped quite a bit. And in terms of our peak latency here, we went from, I don't remember how many objects we were serializing. I think it must have been 100,000 or so, but we basically went from doing it in about 44 milliseconds to 42 in the single-threaded scenario. But in the multi-threaded scenario, if I go down here, we actually have a 28% throughput improvement. Akka.net is extremely multi-threaded in terms of its inherent nature, so that was a really nice win for us. The pooling ultimately helped um, Akka.net improve its throughput for its sort of normal standard use case by about 
Now, this is where we start getting into things like garbage collection settings. Uh, the way you configure your garbage collector can actually have a big impact on how these changes will affect your application. Um, so there's basically this sort of little matrix here of the three different fundamental modes of garbage collection. Uh, there's background garbage collection, which has been enabled by default for quite a long time in .NET now. And what this basically does is it allows a background thread to be responsible for doing most Gen 2 garbage collection. That way you don't have a big GC pause that will affect your app. So a good example, if you were building a Maui application or a WPF app, with prior to having a background GC enabled, you might get, if your application was allocating quite a large number of objects, a visible pause or stutter on screen while the GC operation went through. That's not a good user experience. So beginning, I think, around .NET Framework, when did they enable this? This must have been like .NET Framework 4.5 or 4.6, so quite a while ago they implemented this to kind of move all that work on the background thread. However, most .NET applications by default run with background GC enabled and with workstation GC enabled, where what occurs with workstation garbage collection is that Gen 0 and Gen 1 garbage collection typically happens on your foreground thread, meaning the application threads that your app is using to actually do work. This creates a garbage collection pause that, while it tends to be a lot smaller because it's Gen 0 and Gen 1 garbage collection, which we know is relatively cheap, it still does cause a pause inside your system. So this is kind of like a blocking garbage collection implementation. And this is the default that most applications use. And it is also, if you don't specify, the default all brand new .NET applications still use today. This is where we take a look at server-side garbage collection. Now this is gonna be, I'm, there's gonna be two pieces of advice during this presentation that'll give you the most bang for your buck. You can implement it in five minutes and it might make a huge performance difference for your app. This is the first piece of advice like that, is enabling server-side garbage collection. What server-side garbage collection does is kind of, by definition, ideal for, let's say, ASP.NET or gRPC or SignalR applications. What it essentially does is it fragments the heap on a per-core basis. So rather than having one big heap for your process that's managed by a single Gen 2 garbage collection thread in the background GC system, now you have a heap per core inside your, your, op, your application. So there's, if you have a 16 core machine, you're going to have 16 little heaps that are all managed by the CLR. What server-side GC will do is it'll essentially run a dedicated thread per core for being able to garbage collect each of those independently from each other. So you're no longer gonna have blocking gar garbage collection that causes, let's say, your entire front-end threads to potentially pause. It's all going to happen on a per core basis, and each heap can be managed independently by its own thread and its own set of memory that it uses for that CPU. So this is going to greatly improve throughput, but the cost you're gonna get from it is that memory usage will be a lot higher on average. And on top of that, um, you might notice that the actual amount of CPU time used by the garbage collection process is also higher. In the grand scheme of things though, the juice is worth the squeeze. So let's take a look at an example. To enable, whoops, my, it looks like my annotation is missing a little bit. To enable server-side garbage collection, in case you can't see it, it might be a little too small back there. Um, but in case you can't see it, it's this property right here, server garbage collection is true. When you enable that, that'll go ahead and cause when your .NET process launches, it to run with that you know, per core based mode instead of doing it as sort of like a, a workstation mode. Now let's take a look at some performance figures. Again, apologize if these are too small back there. So this is, I believe, our Aka.Remote Remote uh, ping pong benchmark that we use. This is how we test the end-to-end -end throughput of like a single connection in Aka.Remote. Remote. So I have Workstation GC on my left and Server GC on the right. On the left, I'm doing about 140 to 150,000 messages a second. On the right, I am doing roughly twice that. I'm doing about 295, 293, 291 uh, thousand messages a second there, all by changing one XML setting in my project. That's a lot of bang for your buck right there. So rather than having your engineers spending an inordinate amount of time trying to performance optimize things, maybe just configuring your garbage collector differently can make a huge difference. I've got one more easy win like this for you guys a little bit later in the presentation or again, it's just changing one XML setting. But this is the first one. So enable server-side GC if throughput is important. 
Uh, the one big trade-off here is that if you're running, let's say, a really densely packed server farm where you might have hundreds of multi-tenant applications all running on the same box, this is probably cost prohibitive to enable server-side GC for all of them. Um, but that's kind of an unusual hosting setup you don't see very often anymore. For most of your sort of application workloads, server-side GC is probably worth the trade-off. Now, you got a question? Yeah, like how big of a RAM increase do you usually see? How big of a, so the question was, how big of a memory increase do you see when you go from workstation GC to server GC? Um, Basically, if we were allocating on our heap before, let's say it was uh, 10 megabytes for our um, workstation GC right out of the gate, you might see that the average memory usage might be something closer to 40 or 50 megabytes in there. So not necessarily a 5x increase, because I'm also not getting into things like page sizes and all that. The, the amount of total amount of memory increase, I'd say as a percentage, it's going to be using uh, 30 or 40 percent more memory probably than it did before. And that's not necessarily that the memory is actively being utilized. It's that the application is going to demand that much more capacity in order to have heap space available on each core, right? So that's sort of like requested memory, not necessarily used memory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Would you also enable this for, uh, for UI applications, for example? Would I enable this for UI applications? Well, as long as it's not running on a super low-powered machine, uh, yeah, I'd definitely go ahead and enable it. Um, I don't quite recall why server-side GC is not enabled by default, to be honest with you. Um, but you know, I, don't, I don't think it would hurt. Again, if throughput's important, I would probably enable it. If you're more concerned with, let's say, keeping um, resource utilization as low as possible, let's say you're building a, uh, a application that's gonna run on a thin client that has a really low amount of CPU and memory, I'd probably stick with Workstation GC for that. So the question is, if you're running on containers, is server GC a problem? Yeah. So the question was, if I tell me if I got this right, that if you're deploying Maybe we'll need to get back to that one at the end real quick. Um, now, in terms of technique, so we've talked a bit about how the garbage collector works and how it can affect the performance characteristics of your machine. And we've seen a couple of little examples of like how we can uh, reduce our, our usage of the garbage collector through techniques like pooling. Well, the next thing we kind of want to talk about is from a coding standpoint, what are some little things you might end up doing on the hot path of your application that can result in the garbage collector having to work a lot harder than it needs to? A really good example of this, and Daniel talked about this in his excellent talk yesterday as well, is delegates and closures inside our application. So if we have this little bit of code right here, and again, I apologize for the, the small size, this is the run method of the Akka.net Actors mailbox. This is like the hottest of hot paths inside Akka.net. This is designed to run hundreds of millions of times per second, potentially. Well, we were doing a delegate call down here on this method. We accidentally closed over the this keyword, which is something that you know, ReSharper or JetBrains Rider will warn you about when you're doing that. So we closed over this in order to basically execute a little bit of processing and cleanup code inside this method. So I went ahead and I benchmarked this and said, okay, um, what does our performance look like as sort of a, a bit of a baseline here? And so when we're processing 10,000 messages, we could do that in about 216 microseconds today, and we allocate 385K worth of memory. That's just uh, queuing up messages. And then when we schedule the actor to actually run and process those messages, it takes about uh, 2.3 milliseconds, roughly, and we consume 21 kilobits worth of information. Uh, the enqueue performance on the mailbox is kind of a, a step that happens before this. Well, one thing we did was we simply inlined the delegate. So rather than um, trying to basically rewrite the delegate to pass in a bunch of additional uh, stat properties, then trying to make that delegate cache and make it static, we just took a look at what the delegate was doing and said, you know what, it's not so sophisticated that it's kind of worth it for us to, and plus this code's not callable from the outside, it's all internals. 
we should just go ahead and inline what that delegate's doing and just simplify this code, not avoid having the delegate in the first place. So we moved some of the code the delegate was doing and just kind of copied it right here into the hot path. And here's what the performance characteristics looked like here. We went from allocating when the actor processes messages 21 kilobits when we did 10,000 and 203 kilobits when we did 100,000 all the way down to just a single kilobit going forward. And that one kilobit probably corresponds to something innate with the actor itself, has nothing to do with the volume of messages it's processing. And on top of that, we had a bit of a throughput improvement of around 10%, uh, which really helps uh, speed up your actors by default as well. So just simply getting rid of allocating this delegate that was probably a Gen Zero allocation, it's probably where it was showing up in garbage collection, getting rid of that um, on its own right kind of really helped speed up our application, reduce memory pressure, and just got kind of waste out of the picture for this really critical area of our framework. Now there's a number of other different ways you can go about getting rid of delegates other than inlining them. Inlining is probably what I would do if it's really simple and it's in a really critical area where it's being used. But if you have like a public API and you can't necessarily easily get rid of delegates because end user code relies on having a callback or some other configuration method, there's some better techniques you can use here. Um, See, Daniel in his talk showed using static delegates. That's a new keyword they added in C-sharp 9. You can go ahead and declare a delegate as static. That means that uh, it's not going to be able to close over any local context that it's running inside of. You're going to have to pass in anything, any data you want to use inside that delegate from the outside using parameters. So that's going to use the compiler to help prevent you from having these types of implicit closures and other sources of waste. So static delegates are a good idea. Another thing you can potentially do is a value delegate. This is a technique uh, from Bartosz Adam Chesky that I really like, which is a, a way of basically of kind of having delegates without really writing them as Lambda expressions. And let me show you an example of that real quick. Um, this is a private read-only struct, this request worker task right here. So this is a value type, hence the term value delegate. It implements an interface called iRunnable iRunnable is basically something that's going to get scheduled onto the Akadine Dispatcher. Typically, it's a mailbox processing run, but it could also be something like a scheduled task. It could also end up on there. So we implement this iRunnable interface, and that's this little run method down below here. And this run method will run just the same as a reference type. What we can do in places where we are going to consume this delegate is we basically can go ahead and pass in into this pool you know, Q, uh, user work item. We can go ahead and pull in a new instance of this value type here. Now, you'll note that I make a, a note here that we can potentially create a boxing allocation by accident. If this method takes an object or some sort of uh, reference type down here, we're going to go ahead and undo the work of passing in a value delegate. The reason why is that that'll get converted or boxed into a uh, reference type and then executed inside of there and we're still going to be creating allocations. So what you can't see on this particular piece of code is that this actually takes a generic of type iRunnable and that is not going to create any boxing for us. We're going to be able to pass in uh, this particular struct and that's going to get run behind the scenes without creating boxing. One other thing we're going to talk about is some potential sources of boxing that might have happened in earlier versions of C Sharp can by and large get eliminated now through dynamic profile guided optimization, which is the second big win we're going to talk about at the very end of the presentation. So value delegates are another technique we can use to get rid of um, delegate allocations. Now, another source of potential memory waste that can build up inside our system is empty collections. And here's something that I noticed while I was using uh, JetBrains Dynamic Profiler was I noticed that our finite state machine actor, which basically uh, sends around some little state objects that kind of describe, here's the current state and position of our actor at any given time. I noticed that this thing, when we were running our remoting benchmark, allocated, according to Ryder on here, about 360 megabytes. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, this is like a stupid POCO class that doesn't have any innate data on its own. How could we possibly be allocating that much memory on here? So I decided to look under the covers. And you know what? Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and call an audible here. 
take that four by three resolutions. See, hold on. Yeah. Not, not, letting, not letting my boomer PowerPoint skills get the better of us today. All right. So here's what I found inside the state class is some moron, probably me, decided to go ahead and allocate a new list if the, in the event that the replies was blank. And you know, this is back in 2014, 13, when things were a lot more innocent. You know, back then, we didn't know any better. We were just having the time of our lives. Well, this allocates a new non-empty array every single time I create one of these state objects. Ironically enough, it's creating it when there's nothing for us to actually do. It's creating a bunch of empty lists for no apparent reason. And so that is what is resu resulting in this 360 megabytes worth of, whoops. Well, apparently I should not have taunted PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, okay. So apparently this is basically what the source of our allocations was. So every single time you go and allocate one of these new lists, you're gonna be basically putting 32 bytes on the heap. So this is a really easy fix in newer versions of .NET because the .NET base class library now supports having a static sort of generic property. Oops. There we go. Having a static generic property called array.empty, and you can pass in the type there. That's going to allocate a 32-bit object once per type. And I can go and reuse that every single time I spin up one of these new state classes or every single time I need to use an empty object anywhere throughout my application. So this completely eliminated that accidental source of, uh, of allocations there. Next, in terms of something that is a little counterintuitive, value types versus reference types. The thing we have probably heard over and over and over again from people like David Fowler and other folks who are working on ASP.NET performance is that value types are the greatest things in sliced bread. You should use them everywhere where you have sort of value, you copy by value sort of semantics. That's going to result in a lot less allocations, a lot less garbage collection pressure, going to result in faster software. I am generally also a proponent of that, but it can get a little nuanced, and that's what we're going to take a look at. This is from that same class we're looking at at Naka.net. This is an event that gets emitted every time our finite state machine has work to do. So every time someone wants to send a message to a finite state machine actor, it's going to get encapsulated inside this event type. So we allocate uh, millions of these per second in busy applications here. And this shows up on our profiler when we do that. So if we take a look here, let me zoom in on my little, little graph. There we go. So we benchmarked our finite state machine actor in terms of how much memory and how much time does it take to process a million messages compared to an untyped actor, which does not use these event types. Well, the total amount of memory we allocated for our FSM actor was about 287 megabytes versus our untyped actor, which used roughly a fifth of that, 56 megabytes. Okay, well, that's a little disconcerting. So what if I changed that sealed class that we saw earlier to a read-only struct, functionally equivalent to what we were doing before? Uh, doesn't meaningfully change the semantics of how this actor works. What does our memory allocation look like now? Change it to a value type. And we see a reduction of roughly 30 megabytes on our message processing here. Doesn't reduce it all the way to zero because there's other stuff that the finite state machine actor is doing but basically it reduces the overhead of allocating just the, um, the event class by roughly, it's like 32 bits a pop, basically. So for a million events, we get 32 megabytes total shaved out of the allocations during that benchmark. That's how that sort of gets calculated. So that's a little bit of memory savings there and a minor throughput improvement. Well, one thing we decided to do is take a look at where we are currently using value types, but we're not using them very well inside our application. And this is that boxing terminology I, I mentioned briefly earlier. Boxing is what happens when you accidentally cast a value type back into a reference type. It completely undoes all of the, undoes all of the great work you've done uh, trying to go ahead and use value types inside your system when you do this. So if I take a look here, yeah, boxing is basically when you explicitly cast back and forth. Here's an example of a method right here, if I zoom in some. 
This is inside that finite state machine class again. Again, we found just a lot of stuff wrong with this class when, I, when we started looking under the covers. This is a equality method right here. State name equals next state. An e so quick show of hands for everybody. Who believes that a referential check for equality should return allocations or produce allocations? Show of hands. All hands are down. You all passed the test. Good. This is code smell when you see this showing up on here. It means someone, someone made a boo-boo, as we say, inside our team. So 496 megs allocated. There's trouble brewing. So what exactly is causing this? Well, the issue here, in fact, I'll zoom in one more time. The issue here in this case is that the state name is typically an enum, which is a value type in .NET. And we are actually doing an object.equals call right here, which means we are boxing our enum every single time we call .equals. But if the other thing we're looking at is also an enum, we're also boxing that as well. So we're actually boxing both, uh, both sides of this equation at a given time. Whoops. So really simple mistake. We were just using the, the, nor the standard equals method and just assuming that that would be safe. But no, it actually was not in this case. And thankfully, uh, yeah, JetBrains Dynamic Profiler helped us find that. So we rewrote this code. And I'll zoom in a little bit to make that a little easier to read. We rewrote this code to use the equality comparer. And we pass in the type, the generic type that the users use to create these FSM actors. So equality comparer dot default dot equals. And this actually performs a non-boxing check on both of these enums here. It's basically doing an integer comparison on both of them now. That way, we don't allocate anything anymore. So if I take a look at my note here, this removed 100% of boxing allocations at this call site and helped speed up uh, this comparison operation really significantly by an order of magnitude or more. So again, a really simple type of mistake that's really easy for .NET developers to make and a really good tool like the uh, Dynamic Profiler and Rider can help you find this stuff uh, when you're running your applications. Here's where things get a little tricky which is we actually have a built-in value type in Akka.net that's used really heavily today called an envelope. This is what we use to do in-memory message passing from one actor to another. So we produce potentially hundreds of millions of these a second, depending on how busy your system is. And this today already exists as a read-only struct. Well, what happens when a value type passes from one method to another and you're not using a ref keyword on there? Well, the answer is that you copy it, right? This basically result, if you're passing an integer around through multiple methods, you're copying it by value rather than copying by reference. This is something you might have learned you know, in an um, introductory course on object-oriented programming with C++, C Sharp, or Java, maybe. Uh, those are sort of the semantics for how uh, value types in C Sharp work. Well, this envelope is highly concurrent and gets passed around between lots of different actors and appears in lots of different mailboxes. And there's going to be a lot of copying pressure happening throughout the system on here. So one theory we had was, what happens if we go and change this back to a reference type? Could that actually be faster in this case? Because we're not constantly having to make copies of this data structure over and over again implicitly by moving messages throughout our pipeline. So we thought, OK. We're super mega geniuses. Let's go ahead and see if this works. So what our current sort of baseline performance looks like in Akka.net with this read-only struct is if we have an actor processing a million messages, and this is using the other performance improvements you saw earlier, it takes us about, um, you know, for, actually, for 10,000 messages, it's about 2.2 milliseconds. And then for 100,000 messages, it's about 9.8 milliseconds. OK, let's see what happens when we change this back to a reference type. So if we zoom in here, oops, sorry about that. I've made this back into a, uh, yeah, a sealed class. And what do the numbers look like? Will this actually reduce allocations? And if I zoom out over here, in fact, it sure did reduce allocations, specifically when we're in queuing messages inside the mailbox. So memory pressure actually went down as a result of moving from a value type to a reference type, since we're not doing all that copying pressure over and over again. So we went from, let's say, about yeah, 394 kilobits to two, uh, 264, or from 3.15 megabytes to 2.1 megabytes. Great. This feels like an amazing win. I'm going to go ahead and write a blog post and get an MVP award for sure. 
But wait, there's more. It's not quite that simple. Member of my team, you know, who understands all this stuff, says, yeah, copy by value has its pitfalls. It can result in a lot of pressure when you're moving that same data structure through a lot of different contexts, yada, yada, yada. He says, yes, that is all true, Aaron, and you have proved th proven this using this single-threaded benchmark. Very well done. However, have you considered, <laughs> have you considered what happens when we start running this the way we really do in Aka.net, which is across a lot of threads, where we're going to be passing these value types around, not just on a single thread in a benchmark.net benchmark, but across potentially, you know, in a really large uh, application, it might be 100 threads, or it might be 30 or 40. What happens to that same benchmark when we significantly increase cross-thread message traffic? And I said, all right, game on. I'll go ahead and test this. I'm sure my MVP award is good. So I go ahead and run this little benchmark here. Uh, but we're putting, let's see, about uh, 100,000 messages through. And I'm keeping track of my Gen 0 and Gen 1 allocations here. And so it looks like we allocated with um, my C-sharp uh, reference types here about 104 megabytes when we were doing, let's say, 10 total actors. And when I had 100 actors, we did you know, 10, roughly 10x that, about a gigabyte of memory. Okay, that looks good. I can see my total throughput here uh, was about, on average, took about 1.2 seconds for 10 actors to process 100,000 messages each. And it took 100 act actors, you know, roughly 10x that, roughly 13 seconds. Now, what happens if we convert an envelope back into a struct again? Well, if we take a look at the memory usage, memory usage is way down now that we're back into a concurrent context. We went from 104 megabytes back to 71, from about a gig back into 689. Again, it's that 32-bit allocation disappearing again. That's sort of what happened here. And on top of that, if I take a look at our performance, our performance was essentially unaffected by changing this from a value type to a reference type either way. It was only the amount of memory utilization that really got affected by it. So the sort of lesson here, if I zoom back out, sorry for my, AV, my boomer AV challenges today, guys. This is uh, all kind of doing it on the fly here. Um, the issue in this case is that something that looks like it works in a single-threaded context may not necessarily be so in a multi-threaded context because the way memory gets copied between cores and the way context switching works also has an impact on the ultimate throughput and the ultimate, so let's say, sort of effectiveness of some of these solutions. So lesson learned, um, changing a value type into a reference type, while it worked great on a single core, absolutely sucked when we did it on a multi-core system. And so we move on to the next section, threads hate you and your code. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about memory management in a multi-threaded environment. Um, C Sharp has these concepts called thread static and thread local variables. And there's also async local, which is a little different, and we'll talk about that. What these concepts kind of have in common, the thread local and thread static, is they allocate objects directly into what's known as thread local storage. So this is data that's being allocated inside a special area reserved for that thread. And that's really useful for storing things like potentially um, a bit of work you know that one thread is going to need to refer to over and over again. So an example in Aka.net where we use uh, thread static values is we have a, um, a, le a last recently, uh, least recently used cache, LRU cache, for storing uh, deserialized actor paths. And we use that rather than a concurrent dictionary because we can avoid having to synchronize cache values between all the different cores that are currently doing work on processing those remoting workloads at any given time. Having a thread local construct is inherently thread safe because no one else can access those values, although in theory you can, but it's super awkward and weird, so it's probably very unlikely to happen. Uh, and then on top of that, all the data and work that's being performed while that thread's running are kind of in adjacent registers and memory for that stack. So the downside of thread local data structures is that they can't be synchronized uh, by, def by definition. You could create a, um, a thread static concurrent dictionary if you wanted to, but that concurrent dictionary couldn't very easily be referenced by any other thread. So these sort of thread static constructs are useful in contexts where you're, you know you're going to be performing work 
on the same thread over and over again, and that work's all gonna look uh, quite similar. So this kind of brings us to .NET's threading model and the impact this might have on your application's performance. Reference types that get passed between, let's say, uh, activities running on separate threads are almost always gonna end up in Gen 2. Uh, not always, sometimes you might end up in Gen 1, but typically it's gonna end up in Gen 2. So if you invoke an await and you passed in some data into that, and that you know, object is gonna get used inside that awaitable method, more often than not, that bit of data you passed in there is gonna get promoted to Gen 2 garbage collection. Value types that are passed between threads are simply copied into the stack of the new thread that's there. That's why the memory allocation pressure from our multi-threaded benchmark actually went down, is because basically we were making these sort of uh, stack-based stack copies of those objects over and over again versus allocating new ones on the heap and then trying to move that stuff across um, different, uh, different CPUs. Where the performance sort of characteristics for multi-threading start to become really relevant is the higher I.O. levels that your computer can run at, namely taking advantage of L1 and L2 caching. These are the, the built-in memory caches that your actual physical CPUs themselves have access to. And they tend to be quite small, um, so maybe it might be the L2 cache might have 16 or maybe on a really big processor, maybe 32. And then your L1 cache is going to be an order of magnitude smaller than that, so maybe four megabytes or so. But these have much faster access speeds than even DRAM does on your machine. One of the things that we can typically take advantage of is that if we have the same types of work being performed by the same thread, and that same thread is getting scheduled on the same CPU over and over again, the hardware will begin to optimize the memory access to start moving some of those frequently accessed objects or those frequently accessed methods into those cache lines. And that will allow your application to execute many orders of magnitude faster for that little bit of code. But that kind of re relies on a little bit of what we call uh, sort of thread locality, where the thread is being scheduled onto the same core over and over again. Most operating systems and also the .NET runtime will by default try to do that for you. So the underlying infrastructure is gonna try to do a good job out of the gate. However, uh, it's still possible for your application to experience context switching. Uh, context switching is what happens when work was executing on one thread. Let's say you have a, a long IASync enumerable you're iterating through. You might go ahead and process a couple of your A-weighted operations on thread A, which is running on um, one CPU. And then when you A-weight, maybe that thread has to go service some other work that's more urgent. And then another thread running on another CPU is gonna be the one that gets scheduled to pick up uh, the next A-weight in your chain. That is called a context switch when that occurs. Basically, what's going to happen is that each thread in, and this is kind of scoped more or less to Windows, but the Linux sort of runtime works very similar to this, where each thread is given by the operating system a what's called a quantum of time to work with. And that's usually bounded to about 30 milliseconds of execution time. This value is configurable and also can be different between something like Windows Desktop and Windows Server. So it kind of can vary a little bit. But this is generally speaking how all preemptive operating systems are designed. Where each thread is given a finite amount of time and we do this in order to prevent starvation. So one really long running task crowding out shorter ones. Um, so that thread is going to get scheduled onto the CPU and after it completes its work or after it basically consumes its allotted time, that thread will get moved to the back of the operating system's work queue and the next thread that is scheduled to run on that CPU will get its quantum of time. And the operating system is gonna be constantly kind of managing this and linearizing work where it's possible. And it's going to try to make sure the same threads get scheduled onto the same CPU, but there's no guarantees. It's a little arbitrary in terms of how it can work. Context switching is when thread zero moves onto a different CPU, or in this case, your awaited unit of work was being processed on thread zero, but now it's being processed on thread four. Those types of, those are both examples of context switching, where essentially the runtime co execution context of your piece of code is being changed up from under you, usually through arbitrary things like whichever core, whichever thread was available. You don't necessarily have a lot of control over that as a software developer. Well, as it turns out, 
we actually do have some control over this beginning in like .NET Core 3.0. And I believe, um, I believe the actual task work queue for scheduling you know, uh, t TPL tasks actually does use this under the covers now. But beginning in .NET Core 3, they added a new interface called an iThreadPool work item. This was an interface that basically allowed us to go ahead and schedule work directly on the thread pool without needing to create a bunch of weird little callback delegates and stuff like that. It could basically just be in any arbitrary class that implements this interface can now be scheduled directly onto the .NET thread pool. Well, there's also another new API they added in .NET 6. And I'll go ahead and use my boomer zoom here. Let's get this up and running. All right, there we go. Maybe a little bigger, a little bigger. All right, there we go. This is a relatively new item, uh, API they added in .NET 6, thread pool to unsafe queue user work item. That's a, that, that method's been around for a long time. What's new is this little parameter right here, which is totally unreadable with me being zoomed in here. But basically what this parameter does is it specifies for this particular iRunnable work item, I would prefer to reschedule it onto the same CPU that I am running on right now if possible. Uh, I don't think I have a, a diagram on this, but essentially every single thread in the .NET thread pool has like a local work queue, and threads have the ability to steal work items from each other in order to try to keep the system um, moving smoothly at all times, so that way tasks don't wait a long time to get executed. What this actual uh, call does is it queues this work item right now onto the thread that's currently executing. And guess what? If you have something like an actor that constantly schedules itself over and over again to keep processing messages in its mailbox, that means that actor is going to have a lot less context switching as a result of this. It's going to always essentially provide a hint to the runtime that I want to execute on the same thread that I'm currently running on right now. And so long as there isn't some major starvation or crowding issue or some other um, arbitrary semantic runtime issue that would prevent this from working, what we're going to end up experiencing is a pretty significant impact on performance. So if we take a look here at our little performance comparison, in fact, i got to use the zoom again, pull this out. This is Akka.net's in-memory messaging benchmark, and I think this is running on .NET 6, um, before we added that API call and after we added the API call. So we have two different types of actors we're benchmarking here. Let's just take a look at the actor base on the left. We're doing at about peak throughput. And that throughput value, by the way, on the left, is basically saying how, many like how big of a burst of messages can an actor process at any given time. So when an actor gets scheduled to run, we have the ability to configure how many messages an actor can process. The default value is 30, which is a pretty good, pretty handles like 99% of use cases. So a throughput of one means this actor is going to have the highest possible context switching. A throughput of 900 means while this actor is not going to have very much context switching at all, it's also going to hog threads for a really long time. So it's kind of a little bit of a balance to, to strike there. So let's take a look at the throughput value of 30, which is our system default. We're doing about 41 million messages a second on you know, .NET, uh, .NET 6 before we added that API. Once we add that API, we jump from about 40 million messages a second to 65 million messages a second. So that's, um, now I'm a little jet lagged and I had a lot of beer last night, but I think that's about a 50% increase in overall memory throughput, if my mental math serves me well. That is a tremendous free lunch for an Akka.net user that they didn't really have to uh, do a lot of work for. All we had to do was find a way from an infrastructure point of view to reduce context switching. Um, there's APIs you can go ahead and call directly, just like the ones I showed you for doing this. But generally speaking, the way a lot of the TPL stuff is designed in newer versions of .NET it will automatically help do a lot of this for you now. Make sure that your tasks get rescheduled back under the thread that's currently servicing them. It's not a guarantee, but it's a preference you can go that will be set automatically whenever you go ahead and await a task, usually. So if you haven't upgraded to newer versions of .NET, you should definitely consider doing that in order to take advantage of it. Uh, let's see. I'll move on to the next slide here. Thread locality without context switching. Yeah, we kind of covered that. All right. Data structures and synchronization. So one thing we decided that we thought we could do, being the super mega geniuses that we are, 
was maybe we could outperform the .NET runtime at managing a concurrent queue. Sure, that seems like a trivial problem. I could hack together in an afternoon, right? Yeah, I'm being sarcastic. The concurrent queue is very, very well done. Um, so I, I, I thought to myself, you know, uh, we could, in theory, maybe use a linked list and reduce some of the internal allocations that happen when lots of messages are being queued into the same actor at the same time. So why don't we go ahead and try using a linked list with a lock and see how well that works. Well, if we take a look at the performance numbers for what this looked like earlier, we can see that you know, our queue performance, we're allocating about 385K, and it takes us about 200 microseconds to enqueue 10,000 messages into a single mailbox. OK, all right, that's sort of our baseline. Got it? Well, what happens if I go and change it to a synchronized linked list with a lock like this? Locks are relatively cheap um, from a, a synchronization standpoint. They're not free, but they're not tremendously expensive either. So I'm going to go ahead and use the built-in linked list in system.collections.generic, and I'm going to place a lock around all of the sort of mutable operations on it internally. And I'm thinking this should offer better performance than a concurrent queue because I can go ahead and easily append new items to the end of the list and easily consume items from the front of the list without having to resize the internal collections and the internal memory segments that the concurrent queue uses. Let's see how well that worked out in theory. Well, um, if I zoom in here, we got our asses kicked, more or less. Um, not only did we double the amount of memory usage that we had before, we also more than doubled the amount of latency that we had. So if I were a Ruby programmer, I consider this to be a job well done and check it in and move on. Um, but instead, we went ahead and uh, rolled that back and decided, you know what? Uh, we're probably better off just waiting for the very smart people, the .NET runtime, to make, keep working on concurrent queue and improving that for us each time. So what went wrong there? Well, basically, the concurrent queue is actually a lock-free data structure. Um, this is the sort of stuff that you can go ahead and write for fun if you want to, but it's very difficult to get right in practice. Thankfully, concurrent queue's got a ton of people using it, therefore a lot of regression testing, a lot of really smart computer science type people looking at it. It uses basically volatile memory to go ahead and swap out sections of its internal sort of buffers internally. And it uses some lock-free synchronization methods like interlocked.compareExchange to do this. It's very optimized for lots of quick reads and writes from both the back of the queue and the front of the queue happening concurrently. Um, it is significantly less expensive, even on a single thread, to use this than it is to use a lock inside of there. On top of that, I'm pretty sure .NET's built-in linked list is utter crap, and you would have been way better off writing your own like linked list implementation using pointers, basically, than doing that. So I'm convinced that the linked list data structure on its own was probably a bad choice uh, for us. But nevertheless, the fact that the locking overhead was so high, and we observed that in our tests, meant that we should probably just stick with concurrent queue for the time being. Now, the last thing I'm going to touch on before we run out of time here is a brand new feature that kind of made it into .NET 7 and will be available by default in .NET 8 going forward, which is dynamic profile guided optimization. This is a just-in-time compiler setting for .NET. Uh, this is the second big win I told you about. PGO, which you'll see this acronym appear in like your configuration and also in some of the literature on .NET, Profile guided optimization is basically where the compiler, or sorry, the, the just in time compiler analyzes how your program runs while it's running and makes decisions about how can we speed up some of these frequently used areas of code. Essentially, the, the just in time compiler will make a bet and see how it goes. And if that bet results in higher uh, throughput, it'll keep that bytecode around the next time through. There's two different types of profile guided optimization. There's static PGO, which has been around, I think, since .NET 5. They've had some flavor of this. This analyzes the program when it's not running and makes some optimization decisions ahead of time. This is that cold start reduction you've heard about. So this was designed to kind of help things like serverless functions launch more quickly on Azure, and that type of thing. That's what static PGO does. And that's kind of a JIT function that uh, takes runtime data and makes it available offline to help speed up the uh, reduced cold start times. But the really exciting feature is dynamic PGO. This is new in .NET 6, or sorry, .NET 7, and will be made available by def uh, turned on by default in .NET 8. 
This is the ability for the JIT to optimize your program while it's running based on real usage patterns from live interactions with users or other systems. Let's take a look at it. Um, the cost of turning on profile guided optimization, nothing is free in the software development industry. Um, the cost of turning on profile guided optimization is that the amount of resources your just in time compiler is going to use will probably go up by a factor of three. So in this case, I used a perf view to go ahead and measure this. Um, I was able to compute the total amount of time my application spent uh, in JIT. So when I had PGO turned off, I think I spent a total of 0.5% of CPU running the just-in-time compiler. So out of all the things my application was doing, half a percent of it was just-in-time compilation. When I turned on dynamic PGO, that value jumped from 0.5 to 1.1%. So you know more than a 100% increase in just-in-time compiling time. In terms of raw milliseconds of you know, computation time that used, that's going from like roughly two seconds to 3.1 seconds is sort of roughly how, that in, terms, in terms of uh, practical terms. And this is for an application that ran for many minutes. So it's even though that percent increase sounds big, in the grand scheme of things, it, it for practically speaking, was not noticeable. But the performance impact this had in our application was tremendous. Okay, take a, take a photograph of this, implement both of these settings in your server apps and you get home. This is the money slide. This by itself is worth the, worth the time, uh, time to attend. This will turn on uh, dynamic profile guided optimization. The setting above that turns on server side garbage collection. That's the money shot. Um, you won't need to do the tiered PGO setting anymore. Starting with .NET 8, it'll just be enabled by default going forward. Now, we went ahead and benchmarked some of our code uh, with PGO turned on and off. So we actually compared the performance of two actors. Uh, the dotted line is our receive actor, which uses all sorts of fancy expression compiler magic to try to be fast. This is like clever 2014 era, like performance optimizations. Whereas the untyped actor, which is the solid line you can see up there, uses C-sharp pattern matching, essentially. Just built-in language features, nothing fancy at all. So on .NET 6, the performance of these two over, let's say, a large range of messages is roughly equal. Not, not, there's not, no real clear divergence in performance here. And in .NET 7, again, the performance is roughly equal. There's a little bit of an uh, outlier at the very end down there, but we can kind of disregard that. I wouldn't count that as statistically significant. But when I turn on profile guided optimization, there's a really clear trend that the untyped actor that's using switch expressions and pattern matching versus our super duper smart receive actor that uses delegates and caching and the expression compiler, you can actually see that our code that is simple is significantly faster than our quote smart code. This is because the dynamic PGO system is able to actually interpret and un understand the simple code that we wrote and is able to make that much faster at runtime Whereas our, quote, smart, unquote, optimizations and the receive actor are things that the dynamic profile guided optimization system looks at and goes, well, these dudes are pretty weird. We're going to skip that code. And because we don't know what we're, there's too much going on here. We're not going to try to optimize it. So this kind of changes the meta for how we want to do performance management in .NET to some extent. Simpler constructs that use built-in language features are going to be made a lot faster as a result of dynamic PGO. And the types of optimizations this includes are things like removing interface dispatching overhead, de-virtualizing methods. So essentially there's less uh, function tables and things like that for figuring out which implementation of a method should be called and all sorts of things. And we can see an example of what the cumulative impact of that looks like on our performance. This is our benchmark for Aka.NET 1.5's uh, in-memory message processing without PGO turned on on .NET 7. And we're peaking out around 70 million messages per second here. Uh, bear in mind, we're taking advantage of that um, uh, prefer local uh, API we saw earlier to reduce context switching. So we're doing about 70 million messages a second. Well, if I turn dynamic PGO on, now we're doing about 100 million messages per second peak performance. Uh, and you can kind of see that around, let's say, yeah, 40, uh, one of the throughput is set to about 40 or 90. You can see that show up. So this is a free lunch for us as .NET developers. All I have to do is 
hand over a few more CPU cycles to the just-in-time compiler and enable one XML setting, and I get a you know, 30, 40 percent performance improvement. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Um, on top of that, I didn't I didn't include this benchmark on here just in the interest of time, but our remoting pipeline where we're doing network I/O is actually twice as fast with dynamic PGO turned on. So we go from about 300,000 messages a second to about six or 700,000 messages a second with dynamic PGO enabled. So this is quite the free lunch for .NET developers. This will be enabled by default in .NET 8, which should come out uh, November this year probably. But you can go ahead and turn it on and start reaping some of the benefits and measuring it in your own applications in .NET 7 today using that slide I showed you. So I know we just ran a few minutes over, but um, I'll stick around here for questions for a couple minutes. And then I'll make way for the next speaker and head outside. But otherwise, I uh, want to thank everyone for attending my talk today. Really appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.